Uh, without further ado, welcome and thank you for joining this year's environmental all candidates meeting for the District of Seashell. Uh, since 2011, uh, the SCCA has provided an all candidates engagement opportunity for Sunshine Coast voters to hear from candidates on environmental issues. Uh, this year, we're, particular, we're partnering with the Alliance for Democracy and the Sunshine Coast Climate Action Network to engage the candidates with written question and answer and virtual all candidate meetings across the entire Sunshine Coast. Our goal is to encourage all citizens to engage in the electoral process and to help learn where your candidates stand on critical issues facing our community, future generations, and all life on Earth. We really appreciate that the candidates have made the effort to participate in this meeting tonight. The SCCA works in the territories of the Squamish, Shisha, Talam, Cahos, and Homalco First Nations. I am joining you from Suquam uh, here in Wilson Creek, and the candidates today are vying to represent Chatlich, Seashell the traditional and unceded Suya of the Shisha Nation. We're very grateful for the First Nations of this region for stewarding their, these lands and waters from time and immemorial. We, we honor the reverence Indigenous peoples have always held for, the, for nature, their ancestral and eternal connection with the lands, waters, and ecosystems which sustain us. It is in the spirit of this connection between all life on our planet that we must come together to engage those who wish to lead and represent our communities in a good way. As we are now acutely aware, global climate change is the greatest environmental challenge ever to confront human societies. We know the list, it's drought, fire, severe storms, record high temperatures, famine, warming oceans, sea level rise. These are increasingly impacting communities around the world, ours included. Several extreme climate events which have caused hundreds of deaths and damaged billions of dollars of natural and built re, uh, infrastructure have occurred just in the recent years. Simultaneously, the entire planet is undergoing a mass extinction driven by human activities of unsustainable use of land, water and energy and by human caused climate change. On October the 15th, voters across British Columbia will elect new local government councils and boards. These elected officials will face crucial time-sensitive decisions about how our communities will face the biodiversity and climate crises. We thank all of the candidates for stepping forward to run for office and deal with these challenges on behalf of us. All right, so uh, basic, some basic housekeeping for this meeting uh, to the audience that's listening. Uh, this presentation will be recorded and posted on the SCCA's YouTube channel and website and shared on social media. We ask that you please keep your audio and video off uh, for the duration of the meeting. At this time, you might want to put your screen into speaker view. I do highly recommend that as it will make the show better for you. Uh, during the meeting, I will call on each candidate to do a two minute introduction. We will ask all candidates to answer a question about watershed protection and sustainable drinking supply, uh, drinking water supply. Prior to the meeting, we asked candidates to choose to speak to two of the four pre-written of, of the four other four pre-written questions. Uh, candidates will be called on to answer the two questions they have chosen, and each candidate will have one minute to speak on their three questions before we go to the question from the floor and chat. Participants will be able to pose questions to the candidates at the end of the meeting, and that will be in the chat here on Zoom. Uh, we will provide more details as to how this will all work and when we get to that part of the agenda. Uh, so if you have any questions about navigating Zoom during the meeting, please send it uh, to the candidates uh, or to us, uh, to the audience. If you have any questions about navigating Zoom during the meeting, please direct those questions to SCCA Riley. Uh, if you have a question about the meeting process, please send a direct message to SCCA Suzanne. Uh, now, without further ado, we'll get into uh, the uh, introductions. Uh, we've chosen to start with, um, it will be last name alphabetically from A, and we'll start with the mayoral candidates. First up, uh, Mr. John Henderson. You have two minutes for your introduction when you start speaking. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, my name is John Henderson, and I had the honor of being mayor of Seashell from 2011 to 2014. And I'm looking and asking you to elect me once again. I wish I could be with you all tonight, but I did several months ago commit to being at an event here in Vancouver with a uh, sustainability nonprofit organization that I hope I can encourage to support Seashell. I've long been an advocate for and an early adopter of practical, implementable solutions for conservation and protection of the environment. As most of you probably know, I uh, took delivery of my electric vehicle over 12 years ago, long before it was popular to do so. It's heartwarming to see how many EVs there are on the coast. I should also add, I'm under no illusions that my car itself is, uh, is uh, low, has low impact uh, on the environment, but the zero emissions is something that I think all EV owners are proud of. And I charge it with solar panels. Another thing that I'm very proud of, last year we organized a sea level rise symposium here in Seashell. This was led by a team of national experts on sea level rise, and it's provided a strong base for uh, uh, how Seashell can uh, progress in de defining resiliency and developing actionable plans to address sea level rise. I'm also proud to announce that uh, the symposium has led to Seashell being part of a uh, University of Toronto course on sea level rise. Given I've only got two minutes, uh, the, the water supply issue is something that I could talk about all night. Suffice to say, we have lots of water and we know where it is. So it's unacceptable. Thank you, John. Two minutes. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. All right, and next up, uh, mayoral candidate, Jerry Patterson. You have two minutes. Good evening. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. We can, great. Just wanna make sure. My name is Jerry Patterson. I'm a resident of West Seashelt. I've spent a good percentage of my life in West Seashelt having attended elementary school and high school here on the Sunshine Coast. I have a background in healthcare, which I used in BC, across the Canada, the United States and extended into working internationally, providing healthcare education, uh, both in developed countries and in developing countries. My experience on the Sunshine Coast in the last number of years, I moved here to, uh, to basically to develop my dream farm, which was in West Seashelt, uh, growing food products as well as other products, uh, relying on solar. It was wonderful. It was a dream that came to an end. And the end was triggered by water restrictions. During the time that I was facing the challenges of water restrictions and losing food products to lack of water, I spoke and communicated with local governments. I appeared as delegations at the SCRD. I communicated provincially and federally, asking for help and support for my farm, for food production, the food that I provided by donation to residents of our community. It was fantastic, but it ended with water, with, or with the lack of water. So my experience and knowledge and understanding of the challenges that people on the Sunshine Coast and with this, within Sea Shelter facing during dry weather and with a lack of water, I have that experience. I know that experience. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Ms. Darnell de Seegers, you have two minutes to introduce. Thank you. I'm Darnell de Seegers, mayor of the District of Seashelt. I'm a wife, mother of three, and grandmother of three. I'm also a small business owner. We moved to the Sunshine Coast in 2009, and I was elected to council in 2011. I completed two terms as a councillor and then ran for and was elected as mayor in 2018, and I'm seeking your vote for another term. 
We can no longer ignore the impacts of climate change. The heat domes, atmospheric rivers, and droughts are now happening more often and the impacts are larger. In a recent report by the SDRD, we were told that if nothing is done, downtown Seashelt could potentially be underwater in eight years. To protect the downtown core with our wastewater treatment plant, fire department, and municipal hall and library, let alone the housing and shopping, will require us to implement mitigation measures. Yet given the cost to mitigate and or adapt to climate change, we must collaborate with our neighbors, the Seashelt Nation, the province and the federal government, as the cost is too much for our small tax base to pay. The District of Seashelt as a member of the SCRD over this term has, a hand in, has had a hand in diversifying water supply sources and reducing water use. We must also encourage our residents to realize that we no longer live in a rainforest and that we are all responsible for conservation. It is up to us to plan for and implement strategies to reduce the impacts of climate change. We must do this for our children, our grandchildren, and as the Indigenous community says, for seven generations to come. Again, I'm Darnelda Seegers, and I look forward to your support on October 15th. Thank you, Darnelda. Uh, we'll move on to the candidates for council. Uh, we'll start with Mickey Ar Argropoulos. I apologize, I tried really hard. Uh, you're up first with two minutes. Mickey, are you there? Yep, perfect. Sorry, I had problems with my computer. Okay. Uh, my name is Mickey Argyropoulos. Uh, I'm a housewife, uh, a business owner. My background is property management with the Ministry of Housing in Toronto. Um, I recently have just started, um, I've joined with um, learning more about what's happening. And um, I do feel that we are need to change the way we are living. Um, we need to go, you know, uh, use less of what we don't need. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here to learn and to make sure that um, I follow uh, whatever needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, it'll be uh, Mr. Warren Allen. Hello, uh, my name is Warren Allen and I'm running for Seashelt Council. I'm a real estate appraiser by profession and have practiced on the Sunshine Coast for over 25 years. I grew up here in the 60s and our, my family has lived here and owned property in Seashelt since that time. I'm a homeowner and a taxpayer. As a recent three-term Seashelt Councillor from 2002 to 2011, um, I have the local community knowledge and municipal governance experience to get things done. Some of the accomplishments that we were able to complete during my terms uh, during that period was the purchase and creation of Mission Point Park in Davis Bay, um, which is one of the... Uh, Proud, one of the proudest things I, 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 I uh, was, was participated in. Uh, acquiring the Sunshine Coast Community Forest from the province, we were the council of the day that were offered the watershed to manage by ourselves instead of the BC Timber uh, licenses being offered to private contractors. Um, at the time, for me, it was a no-brainer. Uh, either we look after it or we never will. It was so we accepted the offer and we've been developing it ever since. Uh, the Sunshine Coast, Coast Community Forest is, I think, the right vehicle. Um, there are always uh, opportunities for improvement, which, uh, as it looks this evening, that there have been some questions that we will be discussing in that regard, which I'll be happy to get to later. But uh, no, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Uh, next will be Miss Donna Bell. Hi, everyone. My name is Donna Bell. Over the past two years, I've been the constituency assistant for the Sunshine Coast for our MP, Patrick Weiler. This has immersed me into our community in every sector from nonprofits, stakeholder groups, 
government and, and countless conversations with members of our community. I've attended many meetings that have included municipal, provincial and federal representatives giving me firsthand experience in working with all levels of government. Our small community is growing at a rapid pace and growth is inevitable as more people come to the cities to enjoy our, this beautiful place we call home. I have three priority areas, affordable housing, I'll advocate to BC housing and the province of BC for solutions for more affordable housing stock and support the local development of more low cost rental and workforce housing options. Active transportation, we need more public transit and our highway needs to be safe for pedestrians, cyclists and for driving. And I'll advocate for more funding from our province. One of our previous polls showed that 62% of participants think the best way to reduce greenhouse gas house emissions on the coast is by shifting away from car use. Small agriculture, food is as critical to human health as water. We've all experienced the high cost of groceries lately. Small agriculture uh, should not face water restrictions and we need to increase the urgency of more water to our community and farms. Climate change is, no, is, is affecting our small farms big time. Uh, unprecedented climate events in 2021, drought, heat dome, rains, cold conditions, threatened livestock and crops and brought a tremendous amount of stress to our farmers and, fina and, and financial burden to our local far farmers. It's not economically viable to farm because of these added costs. Thank you and I love, I believe in climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> uh, next we'll go to, uh, next we'll go to Mr. Tom Bramble. Thanks, Keith, uh, and thanks for the opportunity, everybody, to, um, it's great to meet you all. Uh, my name is Thomas Bramble, I'm running for council. Um, I recently moved to Selma Park, so I'm the new kid in town here, um, but I do, whilst I'm, I'm building up my knowledge of um, all of the problems that we're up against, um, I, uh, I do bring uh, a breadth of experience in project management. I've been leading technical projects for a, a variety of uh, large organizations for over 10 years consulting. Um, so. I think that uh, I have a lot of experience to bring in that. Um, I'm, I'm, my, my core competencies lie in assembling a team of people um, and, and dealing, uh, working through those complex issues. And, and it seems like we have a few here that we need to solve as a matter of urgency. Um, environmentally speaking, uh, reducing my footprint um, ha has always been something that's in my DNA. Um, it's, 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 it's fundamental to me to um, leave um, where I reside better than I found it. Um, and, and I would say that I'm very familiar with the technical solutions um, that are currently available to us to help us do that. Um, I was also pivotal in, uh, for while I was living in Vancouver in the uh, enrollment of um, personal electric vehicles um, and helping people, um, particularly through the COVID period, um, find alternative ways to um, navigate the city that were environmentally conscious, um, but, um, but non-polluting. So I'm quite proud of that and would welcome any questions individually on that. Um, I, I would say that uh, uh, what's become very evident to me in a short space of time that I've been exposed to um, uh, the, the challenges we're up against is that water supply uh, wastewater handling and housing availability and and then the very close relationship that those things all play into one another um, are, are fundamental to solving here as soon as possible. Thank you everyone. I need the Zoom tutorial, forgot to unmute myself. All right, well thank you very much Thomas. Uh, moving on to uh, Miss Anna Chen, you have two minutes. Uh, and just unmute yourself please. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'm Anna Jade Chen. I'm running Seashell City Council. Uh, you know, before uh, I immigrated to Canada from uh, China in 2006, I was an uh, immigrant uh, consultant. Since uh, came, came in, coming to the Sunshine Coast, uh, I have raised my children and uh, volunteered extensively uh, in the community. I am also committed uh, to study in a variety of uh, fields, including the international business law, uh, bylaw and the law enforcement, government administration and uh, management, women leadership training and peer education trainings. Uh, I have a following qualification 
and as a bylaw and justice and law enforcement study diploma and certificate in women leadership and uh, current uh, undergraduate in master of international business law and uh, I have uh, some uh, volunteer experience uh, involved uh, local governments and the community. Uh, in 2009, I translated for the ICRD, uh, for the Hillside Industrial Park, for the video translator. And uh, also 2027, I would do stronger, uh, do the Strong Star program, have uh, zero to five years old children and the family. And also, I were involved a lot of uh, like uh, welcoming community project, help new immigrants, uh, you know, uh, get used to the you know, new environment. And uh, and also, I be the, I was be the Capilano University ESI tutor. And uh, I don't have too much uh, like uh, work experience, but I have like uh, only have in the government and two for fourteen. Uh, be the advisory planning commission. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Sorry. Oh, I, I... All right. And next we'll go to uh, Mr. Tim Horner. Hello. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. And thank you for uh, participating tonight, uh, everyone in the audience. Uh, so a quick background uh, professionally, after uh, a decade as a trained CAD drafter uh, working in the engineering field, I started a laser measuring company and uh, it has now been 10 years. I currently have four uh, full-time employees and I continue to help with the day-to-day. -day. I'd also like to note that for the last 10 years, my company has been subsidizing its electricity use uh, with renewable wind and solar power through a company called Bullfrog Power. Uh, I was also a licensed realtor for 10 years. And through these two experiences, uh, I've been involved with reviewing zoning bylaws and OCPs throughout many municipalities in the lower mainland. On a more personal level, my wife and I have been visiting the Sunshine Coast regularly for over a decade. And as many people do, we fell in love with the coast and over just over three years ago, we decided to make the move over here uh, from Coquitlam to raise our children. As much as we both love the coast and in particular Seashelt here, I live in Selma Park, as with any small and growing community, there are many issues, both big and small, that need to be addressed to ensure the district moves forward and becomes a place to live and work for all. Although Seashell has much to be proud of in all the work that's been done recently, I believe the district needs to move faster and smarter to grow, and I believe it can do this, all while preserving the character, charm, and the environmental biodiversity of the area that we all love. For this reason, I decided to run for a seat at the council table. Lastly, I would just like to say kudos to all the candidates that are here tonight uh, and have thrown their hat in the ring. If elected for Seashell Council, I will listen and work closely with whoever is elected to get things done in an efficient and responsible manner. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, next up, Mr. Darren Inkster. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great, thank you, Keith. Hello, my name is Darren Inkster. I'm running for council in the district of Seashelt. I've been in government for 16 years previously. I was the chair of the district of Seashelt Parks and Public Works Committee, chair of the SERD Infrastructure, Infrastructure Committee, past chair of the District of Seashell Trails and Paths Committee. And I was on the Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities Director, Chair of Special Committee on Derelict Vessels to Clean Up Our Inlet. I wanted to remind everyone that tomorrow was Truth and Reconciliation Day. day. The Seashells are our partners. They're the co-stewards of our area. Let's remember this and let's show up at those events. I'm a low energy user and a climate change advocate. We see the results of climate change, the ocean rise, desertification, forest fires, flooding, but more specifically in our area, ocean rise and the threat of forest fires. As mayor, I championed the purchase of a park to protect our estuary at Chapman and brought in a recycling program as well as, well as tree protection bylaws as we know, trees are important to our environment. I also was a huge advocate 
in the, for the community forest and a supporter of the purchase, acquisition, and use of Hidden Grove and a big supporter of volunteers. My extended family has owned a business and lived here in the Seashelt area for over 30 years. It's home. When I make decisions, I always ask myself, what will this look like in 10 years? And is this good for Seashelt? Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Uh, next up, Mrs. Diane McLaughlin. I just need to take yourself off mute, yep. Hi, my name is Diane McLaughlin and I'm running for the uh, role of Seashelt Counselor. Um, it, to me, it appears that council has proposed policies for too much new development when there was already an extreme shortage of water, sewage service and landfill services. Local residents are becoming insecure and homeless, etc. And Seashelt needs livability uh, for all with an honest and I think more responsible council and taxes need to be better managed. So I have a four point um, platform live, about livability. Livability means water, a long-term solution should have been provided by now, probably in the form of a reservoir. Whether we can afford it or not, I don't know, but we need solutions that will work. Secondly, residents must come first. We need to have priority for the water that is here, for the ferries and for affordable housing. Thirdly, we need resilient planning for climate change and sea rise. And frankly, I haven't seen anything to that effect here. I live in the village and it's apparent that by 2030, we could be under water, at least half the village. And we need honest government that's based on more transparency and, and fairness. So I'm community minded, um, experienced and educated. I ha I'm a have been a registered professional planner for over 25 years. I have a master's degree in architecture, a certificate in public administration. I'm a lead a leadership in energy and environmental design accredited professional. And I'm an owner and business person myself working in real estate appraisal lately. And I've been advocate, an advocate for public interest and sustainable design policy in Seashelt and other places doing things like greenways planning for here, um, putting at least an asphalt shoulder on the side of the highway so people can walk and ride their bikes safely. Um, and also in uh, Victoria, designing a, a greenway system with- Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Ms. Brenda Rowe. Hi, thanks, Keith. So my name is Brenda Rowe. I'm a counselor in the district of Seashell, a mom and a registered nurse at Seashell Hospital. I've lived in Seashelt since 1996 and raised my two sons here. In 2017, I dipped my toes into some political volunteer work and became Kim Darwin's campaign manager when she ran provincially for the Green Party. It was dur during that journey that I saw firsthand how engaged this community was. It inspired me to shift away from my volunteer work and commit some years to local government. I was elected four years ago in 2018. And what a four years it, is, it has been, both as a nurse and a counselor. Suffice it to say, this was an unprecedented term. But in spite of that, we led through it. We kept our heads down and continued the work that needed to be done for the people of Seashelt. We started work on better understanding the condition of our assets. We provided strong leadership at the SCRD and got to on with water projects with long-term planning in the works. We got to work on housing with over 200 units of rental housing in development and we applied for and received over $14 million in grants to help pay for infrastructure and other priorities. Of all the work that started or completed aligns with CSELS Integrated Community Sustainability Plan. I'm running again to finish what we have started and see a number of projects to the finish line. This includes updating our official community plan which will help us identify where the community wants future development and what type. This will also inform us as to what our future infrastructure needs look like. We need to ensure that this work is done using a strong climate change and risk mitigation lens. And that lens needs to be applied to all of our major policies. Thank you to all the groups for collaborating and putting this forum on tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, next up, Mr. Adam Shepard. Thanks very much, Keith. My name's Adam Shepard. I'm now president of the East Porpoise Bay Community Association. 
My wife and I moved here in 2016 and we quickly got to involved with our, our community association here. And through the community association started out uh, dealing with town processes like the integrated uh, um, community sustainability plan, which is like a visioning exercise, uh, which had a lot of climate input looking forward for the next 10 years. So I've decided that I want to run for council to see some of that uh, put into legislation. But I, I have to say that because of this forum is focused on climate, uh, in running for council and getting voter feedback, the voters are incensed that the water solution, water supply issue, the solutions are have not been um, put in. Uh, and it's I, I'm not trying to blame council. I think uh, they there's a lot of achievements that they've outlined. Um, they were dealing with council or sorry with COVID global supply issues, but really my priority, if I were to be elected to council, would be water supply. And to me, that comes down to church road and water meters and seashell. Both of those have to be on stream for, by May next year. So that would be my focus. And I can talk about the rest of my platform uh, individually to people. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I uh, will move on to Mr. Alton Toth. Thanks, Keith. Uh, I'm Alton Toth and I'm running for re-election to Seashell Council. I was born and raised here and after nine years away, came back with my family in 2014 and was first elected in 2018. I'm a husband, a business owner, and a father to an amazing teenager who will inherit the earth we leave behind. The issues facing this community are many, but our council over the last four years has made amazing progress. Our zoning bylaws from 1987 with over 300 amendments, but we as a council managed to get a refresh underway with a replacement bylaw to be adopted next week. We just passed a new set of short-term rental regulations that while far from perfect, will go a long ways towards giving our neighborhoods back to our residents. We used grants to build a new stage in Hackett Park and upgrade wharf, trail and inlet avenues to improve pedestrian safety and encourage a more healthy lifestyle. We created a street patio program to provide additional places in our downtown for people to gather and to visit, and so much more. But our work isn't done. We continue to struggle with affordability of housing and where we can build it. And the connections to move between our neighborhoods without a vehicle aren't good enough. The Church Road Wellfield will solve 50% of our water deficit in the coming months, but we need to keep pushing forward with the Langdale Wellfield and also a well at Marianne West Park. Our regional district board recently committed to half hour service for Route 90 and additional increases to the Handy Dart service, allowing those who rely on our bus service, young or old, additional opportunities to get around in a timely fashion, plus encourage fewer cars on our road. I've never really considered myself to be a political person. Uh, despite that, I got involved in 2018 because I felt we needed to be more bold as community leaders. And while I truly believe that that work is finally starting to pay off, we're not done yet. We have so much more to do, and that's why I hope you'll support me on October 15th for four more years on Seashell Council. Thank you, Alton. Uh, that will conclude the, uh, the introduction part of the uh, conversation, uh, and we'll now move into questions. For the audience members just joining us, uh, questions from the floor will occur after they answer three questions this evening, and we'll go through all of that. Uh, Anna, you have a question. Sorry, I haven't uh, uh, concluded my my priorities. <laughs> so, can you give me one minute uh, for for the, my my priorities? I'm not sure what you're asking. Uh, we're about to move on to the first question this evening, which will be on water uh, watershed production and okay. uh, drinking water. No problem. Okay, I, I'm going to introduce uh, myself more about in the in the question. Okay, no problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, there are many actions that local governments in British Columbia can take uh, to both mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss. Uh, in a very real sense, as elected officials, it falls on you uh, to lead the way. Uh, 
to protect natural systems that the, and the benefits that they provide uh, to our communities and to the global health as a whole. Uh, all of the questions that we pose to candidates tonight are within the jurisdiction of the local government uh, that you hope to represent. Uh, so uh, tonight you'll be this question will be on the watershed protection and sustainable drinking water supply and I will address you alphabetically from Z to A. To a. The Sunshine Coast Regional District and the uh, town of Gibson supply drinking water to over 30,000 residents of the Sunshine Coast. The primary water sources for most residents on the coast and all residents of Seashell uh, are the Chapman and Gray Creek watersheds. Like most rural areas in British Columbia, the Sunshine Coast faces ongoing and increasing resource extraction pressures in our drinking watersheds, uh, mainly from logging. Uh, each local government on the coast has different and overlapping opportunities to advance water supply and source area conservation. As the sole shareholder of the Sunshine Coast Community Forest, what will you do to ensure that the Sunshine Coast Community Forest transitions to a sustainable forest management model, stewards ecological values, and protects the Chapman and Gray, Gray Creek watersheds? As I said, we'll address the candidates alphabetically from Z till A. Uh, that leaves Alton Toth uh, one minute to address the question. Thanks, Keith. Uh, the community forest is currently shifting towards ecosystem based management, where they look at the area around a cut block to ensure that they're leaving more wildlife trees and corridors within the block itself, and generally do a better job of forestry than the private sector ever will. Uh, it was the current council and also forward looking members of the community forest board that decided to make this shift a priority. Uh, additionally, the community forest has committed to no logging in the Chapman Creek watershed for 25 years. Uh, which is something that I doubt you'll hear the same commitment from BCTS or from private companies. And I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Alton. Next, uh, Ms. Darnelda Seegers. All right. Do I wait for the clock to come up? There we go. So a few things. Uh, District of Seashelt is working with the province to potentially be the first community in BC that allows for the reuse of gray water in new homes. It's not something that's in uh, legislation. We have staff who are working on trying to get that in, in place. The district seashell is also the final community on the Sunshine Coast that will be in, implementing water meters and those should be happening soon. So um, Alton talked about ecosystem-based management. So the Great Bear Rainforest is using ecosystem-based management. The Sunshine Coast Community Forest is implementing that it's a little trickier because we're much smaller um, land base that we have, but that's what we're looking at doing. It integrates biological, social, and economic factors into planning. So uh, very much looking at environmental pieces. Thanks. Thank you, Darnelda. I, sorry, I meant to mention before I started this question that I'll be referring you all to your, by your first names from now on. So uh, Adam, you'll be next. Thanks, Keith. Uh, I'd like to echo those last points that the, the Sunshine Coast Community Forest gives us an element of control over the uh, uh, watersheds and the, their move into eco-based management is, is going to protect more than just the water systems, but species, um, uh, plants, insects, and so forth. So it's a great move, whereas outside the SCCF, uh, they seem to be subject to BC timber sales, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to battle. So I think we have quite an advantage that way, and uh, we could look at further measures like the water, sustainab water sustain sustainability plan or uh, further policy tools to, to enhance our protection. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, next, Brenda, one minute. Sorry, I thought Alton would be before me. Alton went first. Oh, I'm so confused. I don't know my alphabet. I'm sorry. Um, just to mirror what some of the uh, candidates have already said, it was our council that really supported um, the community forward forest um, to move towards this new sustain more sustainable um, management of the community forest. And um, that's going to go a long way to um, give us 
some sound protection. I think it's really important that we continue to stay fully engaged with them. Obviously we're their shareholder, that's our responsibility, but also to make sure that they um, continue to communicate with the uh, community. Um, that was a big message uh, that came back from the last set of consultation um, that was done. The C I agree, the Seashell Mayor Program will, what? Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. Uh, next, um, uh, Diane McGl Diane, sorry, you're up next. One minute. Good. Uh, well, for one thing, I want to point out that we have not met our climate change targets for reducing uh, carbon. And so that means everything we do is at risk, okay? Um, in terms of this question, I think there's different ways to use water, to use gray water, to use water off our roof, to look at the, all the different types of water that are available to us and to use them for appropriate uses. Um, also, people can do a water-wise assessment. The SCRD has got that for people so that people can meet a target for actually realizing how to be very water-wise. We need asset management of all of our uh, roads and utilities, water, um, sewage, and that hasn't happened in Seashelf. And we need to protect the quality and quality of water. We have got areas that are sensitive ecosystems, but we need buffers around those so that they're better protected. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, next, Jerry. Thank you. Our watersheds and our water supply are assets. The focus that I have as mayor for the District of Seashelt, and also as the mayor sitting on the board of the SCRD is asset management. And that includes our watersheds and our water supply, both that are very important and very critical to these communities. So as the mayor for the District of Seashelt and as the mayor sitting on the board for the SCRD, I would be strongly advocating to support and look after our assets, which are both our watersheds and our water supply. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, next up, Darren. If you take yourself off mute, please, sir. Keeps going on mute. Thanks, Keith. I wanted to just mention and ask this group really quickly if many of the people in this group have read the book, The People's Water, because this issue is all about education of what's been going on and happening with water on the Sunshine Coast. Read the book. The community forest, when we acquired it, was local control over our resource. When I'm on council and when I've been on council, I would not support any action by the community forest in the watershed. The SCRD will not support that. And this will continue. I'm glad there's 25 years extension. Keep people on council who will make that happen. There's estuary protection that we've done with the acquisition of Mission Point Park. We need to introduce water-wise home devices, meters. The eco-management of community forest is a key piece. And we need to look at the Thank you, Darren. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, Tim. Thank you, Keith. So uh, I'm not going to lie, I'm, I'm not 100% familiar yet with the community forest, um, but I do understand, as I already mentioned, that uh, they are already on track towards uh, sustainable forest management. So if elected, I would, of course, familiarize myself uh, with the community forest and continue or to work, work with council to ensure that uh, they continue uh, to move toward their sustainable forest management model. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, next up, Anna. Honestly, I don't have too much experience about how to deal with the shortage of water, but I'm going to use my passion of, uh, for the community, serve our community, 
and uh, to uh, I, uh, I when well, since I decided to uh, get elected for the city council, I interview with uh, like uh, uh, some expert and also my neighbor, and they they all have same concern. So I needed to learn more about uh, tools, how to solve the uh, local this uh, uh, common common uh, issues. So I I still not learner, but I'm going to to work on that and use what I learned from my uh, master. And uh, I think uh, in my previous uh, experience, I have very passionate about, about my community. This is what I want to do. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, next, Thomas. Thanks, Keith. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna pretend that I'm an expert on this subject, um, but what I will say is there clearly are a number of experts here. Um, and, and where I think I bring value that hasn't been mentioned is um, is, is assembling a team, like understanding um, all of the um, the factors that are at play and, and, and contribute to solving this problem, um, and, and being able to develop a roadmap that's achievable, um, understanding the costs, um, and, and actually uh, achieve, delivering that in, uh, on, on, a, on a predetermined timeline. So that's that's where I think I can bring real value to this. Um, I I'm genuinely concerned that. Uh, the, the one day I'm, I'm going to turn on my faucet and, and no water comes out. Um, and so for me, this is an absolute priority. Um, I think there, are, uh, um, there's an opportunity for creative problem solving here. Um, and, and I want to be front and center leading that. Great. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, next, Donna. Thanks, Keith. Um, first, there are a couple of points that signal to me that the Sunshine Coast Community Forest um, is serious about their commitment to transition to the ecosystem-based management. Uh, they have set up an opportunity for people to join a community advisory panel, inviting people who want to make a difference and help with solutions. I'll be asking to see the minutes of these meetings. They've openly stated that they'll be setting up metrics in their business plan to measure how they are doing and how they have come far they've come with their mandate. This is something I'll be asking to see. I'll continue to support and understand what the incredible stream keepers do. Their work is integral and they are literally the keepers of our streams. Their ongoing reports of the state of our streams with respect to their ecosystem health can also uh, alert us to any changes in our watershed areas. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Next up, Warren. Hello. Um, so a bit of history, a backstory, if you will. When we were originally offered the area we now refer to as the Sunshine Coast Community Forest, we were provided with studies that indicated our watershed was at that time was one of the most heavily impacted watersheds in the province. So we had a choice. We could either manage it ourselves and accept the offer from the province or continue to allow BC timber sales, as I've mentioned earlier, to continue handing out forest licenses. So I, but, but, you know, having said that, there are always ways to improve our practices and our policies. Uh, I totally support um, moving forward with, with uh, developing uh, uh, plans that would respect that. And speaking with Chairperson Kathleen Suttas and Operations Manager Warren Hansen last week, they indicated they're incorporating this EBM, ecosystem-based management practices, that has been referred to here by a number of candidates. I'd encourage them to come to council as soon as we're elected to introduce us to them and their policies. Thank you, Warren. Uh, next, Mickey, and finally. I'm going to say the same answer as Tim said. I have no idea, and I'm not going to be sitting here lying. There's a lot to learn. Obviously, we do have a problem. Um, but I can't turn around and say what the problem is and how we should be dealing with it at this time. I'm always learning and I will learn as older as we get, we always learn. Thank you, Darnelli, smiling. Thank you, Mickey. Uh, we will uh, move, thank you for that question. That concludes that question and we'll be moving on to the next one. Uh, the next one will be answered in the order of uh, alphabetical by A to Z by first name. Uh, and uh, the candidates beforehand have chosen which of the next four questions they would like to answer. Uh, so I will only call upon the uh, candidates that have chosen uh, to answer these questions. 
Uh, elected officials need to support to lead well on climate change issues. Climate Caucus is a nonpartisan network of local elected officials and a thousand plus allies across Canada. Its mission is to create and implement socially just policies which align with global climate, biodiversity, ecosystem services, and reconciliation targets. If elected, will you commit to engaging with Climate Caucus and ensuring that all council and or board decisions are considered through the lens of mitigating climate change, protecting biodiversity, and sustainably managing our natural assets? Candidates, you'll have one minute to answer these questions, or this question, I apologize, and uh, we will start with Adam. Thanks, Keith. Um... In terms of uh, in terms of viewing every decision through the lens of uh, um, the caucus uh, climate caucus uh, guidelines, I, I don't think I can promise that up front. Um, what I would say is that sustainability is already part of the the strategic plan of uh, of Seashelt. So I would continue to insist that it's an important part of, of major decisions. Uh, and uh, I, I have to say that as someone who's looking to get on to council, um, it's a very handy uh, guidebook for, for policies uh, for local candidates. So if you take a look at the, their guideline of where they're uh, suggesting that improvements be made, you can see where the town has already, already made some motions in that direction. Thank you, Adam. We'll move on now to Anna, one minute. So this uh, climate, climate change caucus is the national and, uh, and also local, local issues. So I'm going to work on that issue and uh, organize, call on the more people join our, our uh, community uh, project. I might create uh, more uh, like a, a project to organize the public health awareness to protect the, the, the environment and also uh, uh, organize others and uh, learn from others province, uh, you know, successful experience about this kind of uh, climate change and also global uh, research, global um, uh, better method to how to solve the local problems. That's what I'm going to do if I let it. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. On to Brenda. Thanks, Keith. Yes, I am actually already am a member of the Climate Caucus, but if I'm being totally honest, I've not been as engaged with it as I wish that I had been. I think what's um, important to understand about the Climate Caucus as well uh, as obviously it focuses on climate, but it's actually really uh, has a holistic approach. And the goal is for the kind of community that um, we want to be, and that's resilient, but also includes health and a strong presence of um, social justice, I think you could say. That's actually what drew me to it in the first place. So my commitment is to increase that level of engagement and look at ways that I can I can apply that engagement and resulted learnings into my role in municipal government, making sure that our policies where they can be are viewed through a strong, strong climate uh, change lens and risk mitigation is vital. Thanks. Awesome, thank you, Brenda. On to Darren now. The Climate Cau Caucus is an interesting one. I know that a number of members on that committee are people that I've served politically with before. And uh, it's interesting to hear Brenda uh, reference the group that she's part of. I believe that uh, the Carol Ann from Paul River running for mayor and a number of leaders from Vancouver Island are part of that caucus. Because a number of us have had a lot of discussions on the caucus over the last number of years and some environmental ideas that come from that caucus. So it's important to be part of that larger learned group, to be part of the discussion to let our community into the changes that are happening to the planet and how we combat and how we, be, we will be environmental stewards and to publicly consult with our community. So I believe we should continue to be part of this caucus. 
If I was on council, I would love to serve with Brenda on that group because I have many friends and colleagues and there are many good ideas that come from within that group and come from within the Columbia Institute's hundreds of hours that I have attended with the Columbia Institute. So I'm totally committed. And I love Thank you, Darren. Uh, next up will be Donna. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm not a member of the Climate Com uh, Caucus, but I've done a lot of reading on it. Uh, it appears to be a very powerful group of people who are committed, certainly to the crisis we're facing. Uh, and it also appears to be a really an excellent source of resources and to have many benefits for municipalities. At this point, I don't see any reason uh, for not engaging, but I will want to know more about the benefits of it for, for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Uh, moving on, Jerry. I've also been researching the Climate Caucus in the last number of days, more than I had done previously. Interesting group, great ideas, lots of research, and a focus on education to anybody that's interested or participating. The question is um, a little bit complex in that uh, as a person, uh, yes, I would join the Climate Caucus. The question that I have, and I believe it was also raised at the SCRD level is regarding whether a local government or a regional district has the power or the authority to join collectively, or if we join individually as people rather than as government officials. So I'm not sure on that and not sure on the legislation and would need to pursue that before making a commitment on behalf of the local government. But I'm committed. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, next up, Mickey. On that question, I would be willing to engage discussions with council to assure that concerns are raised when making decisions that may have an impact on environment and climate change to ensure that council makes the right decisions. I will be committing to protecting the taxpayers by ensuring my voice is heard on council. That campaigns are held accountable for paying their fair share of taxes and costs as it relates to project climate remediation. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. I just want to acknowledge that Alton has raised his hand. He will choose to rebuttal after Tim's statement. Thank you, Alton. Tim, you're up next. Thank you, Keith. So yes, quick rebuttal. Uh, I don't believe I said I had no idea, uh, but, uh, but I definitely do have a lot to learn regarding the community forest. Um, so in regards to the Climate Caucus, yes, two weeks ago, I had no idea they existed. Uh, I've done a, quite a bit of research now over the last two weeks, uh, and uh, they are definitely a great group. Um, and to answer the question, if elected, I would definitely in, engage with the Climate Caucus uh, on issues that relate to their mission uh, to help uh, the council and uh, uh, or, sorry, to help the council uh, make decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, just for the audience at home, Alton has chose to use his one rebuttal for the evening. Uh, one comment uh, on this. So, Alton, you'll have one minute. Alton. Thank you, Keith. Uh, it's not a rebuttal per se. Uh, I know of the work of Climate Caucus, and I know some of the people who are in it. Uh, but Donna McMahon, uh, Director for Area E, uh, has just been acclaimed to represent the area for an additional four terms. And I know that she is a member of Climate Caucus and she's a very enthusiastic and vocal voice uh, bringing forward changes and initiatives from Climate Caucus. So I just wanted to say that I'm glad that we do have a foot in the door through a director with the Sunshine Coast Regional District already. Uh, she's, she's a strong individual. It's not a path that we're gonna have to forge alone. Thank you. Thank you, Alton. All right, well, that concludes the first question or the second question of the evening. Uh, for everybody at home, you will have a chance to ask your own questions through the chat uh, after they answer two more questions. 
Uh, and uh, well, I believe it's two more questions. Maybe it's three. <laughs> well, we'll see how it goes. Uh, anyways, uh, we're moving on to the next question now. And uh, that question will be answered uh, alphabetically, Z through A by first name. Uh, this question deals with environmental development permit areas, or as they're affectionately called, EDPAs. Uh, EDPAs are one of the few legal tools that local governments have to mitigate impacts of private land development. EDPAs are clearly identified areas within which development and land alteration must be regulated in order to protect natural assets and environmentally sensitive areas. However, if DPA guidelines or development permit area guidelines are not clear and supported with permitting policy and bylaws, with permitting policy and bylaws, they may become cumbersome and ineffective. As an, elective, as an elected official, will you commit to supporting the creation, use, and improvement of EDPAs, including bylaws and policies, to protect ecological and natural asset values in your community and all throughout the Sunshine Coast? Uh, and so I am going alphabetically from Z till A. Uh, Warren has chose to answer this question. Warren, you will go first. You'll have one minute. Um, my short answer is yes, uh, to flesh it out a little. Uh, and why are EDPAs uh, one of the few tools that we have available to us? Simple answer again, zoning and taxation are essentially the only tools that local governments have in their toolbox to manage their communities and natural resources. So if elected, I, I'm, I'm happy and would totally support a review of our current zoning bylaws and consider any policies that maybe other communities have that are dealing with this same issue. Um, you're only good as, as the information you gather. And uh, there's always ways to, to improve the system. I'm totally in support of that. We already have DPAs, as some of you may or may not know, geotechnical issues are, are closely related to EDPAs, if you will, floodplain uh, mitigation, um, uh, unstable soils, they're out there. We just need to fatten them up some, and I, I'm totally in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Uh, on to Mickey. You'll have one minute. Thank you. I would support providing a balanced approach that looks at all aspects of a project to ensure a common sense approach is raised in, in council. I will certainly be willing to improve my knowledge so I can raise better discussions at the council level when considering subdivisions. I would be willing to engage discussion with council to ensure that concerns are raised when making decisions that may have impact on environment and climate change, ensuring that council makes the right decisions. As a council member, I would always raise initiatives and awareness. If elected, I would ensure council that council considers when looking at related projects to consider use of fossil fuel and its negative impacts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mickey. Uh, moving on, it will be Jerry. The weather events of last year, November, 2021, were a wake up call for many of us of the need of having OCPs and zoning bylaws and management of our lands, our property. And this is asset management again, looking at making sure that our properties are protected. So yes, I support the revision and changes to the OCP of adding a new area for environmental DPAs to the OCP and ensuring that the uh, bylaws, in particular the zoning bylaw, are consistent with to ensure the protection of our community now and moving forward as our climates change. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Diane, you're next up. <coughs> Um, I would like to say that ecological values should come first and they don't necessarily 
they don't ever follow political boundary lines that we have for the different municipal, municipal uh, areas in the RD. So I think overall planning between the RD, Gibsons and Seashell is essential. Uh, we need to plan all that together. Um, I think we need a paradigm shift, uh, Jerry's right. I think uh, we need to uh, establish them as priority in all the planning. The OCP needs to be reviewed. Um, we have development permits, but we need to have the environmental permits be the priority. We need covenants and we need new zoning bylaws based only what we can afford to uh, support through the environment. And we need to start from scratch. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. The last candidate to choose to answer this question is Darnelda. Thank you. So the District of Seashelts Official Community Plan has development permit areas, DPAs, that deal with riparian setbacks, steep slopes, et cetera. Staff review these and ensure that development and buildings comply with the requirements in the DPAs. Um, if a development is looking to request a variance of some sort, they must provide justification and a sign off by a qualified environmental professional before the variance can even be considered. But when the OCP comes up for review in the next few years, we we'll also need to revisit and update the DPAs. Climate change impacts like sea level rise, atmospheric rivers, et cetera, will need to be incorporated as well then. Our guidelines are clear, but they need to be reviewed in light of climate um, impacts. Uh, one final thing, the SCRD has just applied for a grant in conjunction with the other municipalities on the coast to look at impact of sea level rise on our coastal communities. Thank you, Darnelda. That will conclude that question and we will move on to the next one. Uh, the next one will be answered in alphabetical order, but starting at B. Uh, Sue Big Oil for costs of climate impacts on infrastructure. Multinational oil and gas companies have spent millions uh, to deceive, deny and distract us on their way to billions in profit, specifically $3 billion a year for the past 50 years by preventing action on climate, on climate change. West Coast environmental law is spearheading a Sue Big Oil campaign to force oil and gas corporations to pay their fair share for the harm that they're causing. If elected, will you commit to protecting taxpayers by seeking to recover a fair share of the climate costs from fossil fuel companies and setting aside at least $1 per person towards a community fund to sue big oil. Uh, so we will start, this will be one minute and we will start with Brenda. You have one minute. Thanks Keith. So this is something that we need to give serious consideration to. It may only be a grassroots movement now, but many strong initiatives start as, started as a grassroots movement. And being a founder partner, founding partner of a couple grassroots organization myself, I'm a fan of that. The cost of climate change is hitting us square in the pocket, but there is no doubt we know that catastrophic events are happening more often. Events that were only one in 10 years are now one in every two to three. And with every half degree rise in Earth's temperature, that frequency number lowers. So if you weren't a believer in climate change before, there's no denying it now. All my life, I've had to look to science to guide my professional practice, and this is no different. Um, so I have much to learn about this Sue Big Oil campaign, but I am willing to commit to doing so and advocating that our next council and the public do the same. And we'll cons uh, get some consultation from the public. And um, I would expect that council will take it from there. Great, thank you, Brenda. Uh, moving on, uh, we will move on to Donna. I, um, there's, there's many ways that I always like to uh, emphasize that we can contribute to uh, reducing fossil Fuels. And I think I see that happening a lot in our community. Uh, we can certainly, we can turn off our lights. We can use appliances for Energy Star labels. We can reuse products like the cloth bags that I see a lot of people. Uh, we can take public transportation. Public education is an integral part of making this happen. And I'd like to see more in initiatives at the grassroots level so that we can really become a part of, uh, of this whole fossil fuel issue. Um, I attended the, the, the uh, Sioux Big Oil campaign at the Legacy Gardens, and it was tremendous. It was so good to see so many people out there caring about their community. And I certainly want to know uh, more. I think at this point, it would be good to have them come and do a presentation to the council. And uh, I certainly look forward to hearing more about it. And I'm a very support of the initiative. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on, uh, Tim. Thank you, Keith. <clears throat> so uh, I I like where where their heart is. Um, I like the I, I somewhat like the idea, but I believe it needs more review and uh, definitely more public consultation uh, before setting aside any money to join a lawsuit. Uh, so to to answer the question simply, um, at this time, no, I would not commit to joining the Sue Big Oil. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, next will be Adam. Thanks, Keith. Um, I, I attended the Sue Big Oil event as well on uh, September 18th, and uh, it was a very rousing number of speeches. From a personal standpoint, I, I'm absolutely committed. Uh, I agree with Diane that there has to be a seismic shift in our behavior. And, um, you know, from a personal uh, standpoint, we've gone ahead and put in solar power. We've moved ahead when we have a, a, a large uh, purchase in terms of a new car. We've gone to a plug-in hybrid. So, so we're fully committed. My only hesitation, as I think someone else has said, is that when we go to council, we're then committing taxpayers' money. And uh, everyone might know that in the Coast Reporter, there was a vote and most people actually voted against it. So um, I'd ask the group to come to council to make their pitch. Thank you. Uh, I, we're all human and we all make mistakes. I have, uh, I accidentally left out uh, Thomas. Uh, so before Alton, I'm gonna give Thomas his uh, time and I apologize greatly, that was not my intent. No worries at all. Thanks, Keith. Um, so I, we've got a lot to do to, to, to build out our infrastructure, um, to, to build our capabilities against um, environmental event resilience. Um, and that's really expensive. I think if there's an opportunity here to offset that um, with um, uh, the proceeds from uh, a legal case uh, against the, the big oil companies, and, and those numbers are scary, um, then I think we have to pursue that. Um, in Coming back to your question of um, pledging $1, um, I think it's more complex than that. I think we need to understand what's our probability of success um, and, and then make an informed decision as to how much resources we wanna put into this. Um, perhaps it's more, perhaps it's less, um, but I think we need to make an informed decision and then attack it, uh, attack it accordingly. But um, this, this, this is something that we have to pursue. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, and final word, Alton. One minute. Thanks, Keith. Uh, this isn't one of those things that seven people should decide, uh, though I am in awe at how many of the candidates were curious enough to be at that launch. This is a fundamental shift in community values that I truly believe needs to come from the community uh, as a petition with lots of signatures. If such a petition comes forward to show that our community is supportive of this endeavor, I will support it. I know that at this time, it's still an extremely divisive issue and I'm more interested in trying to bring people together as we move forward rather than pit them against each other. Uh, however, I'm not opposed to something like an EPR fee being applied to petroleum in order to help fund climate adaptation work that we're going to have to undertake as a society. Uh, I, I, to be honest, I look forward to hearing from the community on this initiative. Thank you, Alton. Uh, that'll conclude that question, which is our third uh, uh, question that you guys were given. We have one more question that you guys were given for the audience in attendance. After this next question, we'll be asking for questions from the audience uh, in which they will have uh, one minute to answer. Um, and I also, I applaud all of the candidates this evening for moving so quickly through this because we're flying and you guys are doing awesome. Uh, so we'll continue on to the last question or the second to last question. No, it's the last question. Uh, <laughs> all right, so thank you. And, oh, and this question I'll address for, uh, alphabetically backwards, starting at T, just to make it fun. All right, uh, so as the climate changes, we're seeing increasing average annual rainfall. Meanwhile, average summer rainfall is decreasing. 
Uh, extreme weather events are happening more often, resulting in increased runoff across the landscape. Water isn't absorbed into the soils, riparian areas, and aquifers. These conditions create major challenges with runoff and erosion management, uh, increasing flood risk and decreasing source area recharge. This all comes at a high price. Estimated costs of rebuilding after the tragic BC atmospheric rivers last fall are in the billions of dollars. And this doesn't account for the long-term impacts on fish, habitat, and infrastructure, and ultimately humans. How will you work with, our, with your council and board to adapt to these extreme and, and changing conditions, mitigate impacts on communities, infrastructure, and fish habitat? Uh, we will start this one with Thomas. Thomas, you have one minute. <laughs> You're, uh, you're getting back at me for... Uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks, <you> Keith. <laughs> um, so, I, as I mentioned before, I, I don't have all of the answers today, and I'm, I, I'm certainly not going to profess to, but I, I do think it's important, um, given that this is a four-year term, to um, uh, elect somebody that um, you feel is able to react and mobilise um, in, in what is a very volatile and changing environment. Um, I, I had a family member that survived um, Hurricane Katrina, um, so I, I, I saw firsthand the severity of um, or, or the impact of severe weather events, and, it, and it's absolutely catastrophic. Um, I think that we need to take a long-term view and approach to um, how, how we tag this. We, it has to be a multi-year roadmap. Um, we, we have to identify um, the key areas at risk um, and then attack them um, uh, in 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 order um, over over the years, this, this it's it's not a quick solution. Thank you, Thomas. I didn't pick T because your name starts with T, by the way. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> <laughs> All right, coming up next is uh, Diane. Are you going to have to unmute for us? I, I'm unmuting. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Uh, well. I sent a map that shows the areas um, in Seashell that are expected to be in the village underwater. And also uh, I sent one to Davis Bay for Davis Bay. Porpoise Bay is another area that's severely at risk. And so I don't know, you know, what Mr. Henderson has talked about at U of T, but we haven't heard anything about how it's going to be addressed for us. And so I think we need to assess it. We need to do various scenarios for how quickly things might happen and what the damage might be. And honestly, you know, I think we're looking at retreat. In all honesty, I don't see we're going to get a big seawall built around the entire coast, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, moving on, Darren. And just unmute your uh, device, please, sir. I guess I forget that. I think you keep muting, Keith. I forget you're doing that. There's two issues mentioned in here, sea level rise and estuary and re river and creek problems. We have a number of rivers and creeks in the district. Actually, <laughs> I should be more clear. Chapman sometimes seems like a river with the heavy rains, but it's called a creek. But what we should be doing with the Chapman, Gray, Wakefield, and other creeks is shouldering and monitoring in heavy rain and reinforcing the sides of those creeks to prevent runoff. We should be dealing with sea level rise by looking at a green shores program and looking at strengthening a waterfront. We cannot deal with the flooding of our downtown and many other areas that will cut off the entire Sunshine Coast and main parts of our community. I proposed in 2005 putting $60,000 aside for mitigation of sea level rise and river problems when I was on council. That amount was defeated, but now here we are. Thank you, Darren. Is, Thank it, you. Okay if I, is it okay if I mute you? <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on to uh, Darnelda. All right, so the atmospheric river in November of last year caused lots of flooding in the district. Culverts that have been in there for many years are undersized for the volume of water that we're seeing now. So at the Union of BC Municipalities Conference, Team Sunshine Coast, that's all the governments on the coast, got a commitment from Ministry of Transportation staff to work collaboratively on budgeting and projects going forward. This is important because the highways under Modi jurisdiction, um, and we saw the highway through Davis Bay flooded and lots of culverts that went under the highway. So there's lots of work to be done in collaboration with Modi. 
Uh, staff at the District of Seashelt have created and implemented an improved process to, main, to maintain flow of culverts and reduce damage from future atmospheric rivers. They've expanded the drought resistant plant program. And we did hold a session for the community called Game of Floods. Um, one final thing, we are involved with the regional growth strategy with the Sunshine Coast Regional District to see how we can together look at this. Thank you, Darnell. Uh, next will be Anna. You have one minute. I think uh, we need a system to change. Uh, you know, in, in uh, you know, rainfall and, uh, you know, uh, for example, for Davis Bay, uh, the seawater increase. And uh, in summertime, we so dry, you know, our wedges are all die, dying, you know, we need a totally change, like, uh, you know, uh, instantly and also uh, durantly and durant and other frequency to focus on this system change, not only like uh, we, we just, uh, when, when a problem happened, we, we, we focus on that. We need uh, all the time to, to see how the system, how that work for the community, for the local community, local residents, beneficial for them, you know, not like uh, only one time work, work on that project, you know. We need a system change. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, next will be Alton. Thank you, Keith. Uh, District of Seashield staff have been champions uh, bringing forward changes to current policy around improving our stormwater runoff, culvert maintenance, uh, and other critical infrastructure issues. They live here and play here too, just like us. Uh, and we need to continue to support that work that they've been doing on that front. Uh, Seashield simply does not have the resources or jurisdiction to be involved everywhere that it needs to be on its own. That's where our community partnerships, uh, such as uh, stream keepers and eelgrass replanting uh, and advocacy efforts, such as with Modi around improved highway infrastructure and drainage uh, are going to make a significant difference. And finally, just to close out, a managed retreat from our waterfront is likely going to be a very real necessity over the coming years to decades. Thank you. Well, that sounds like fun. Uh, next up, uh, Warren. Hello. Um, as I've already included comments about these issues on my Facebook page, um, feel free to follow me on Facebook. This is clearly one of my first priorities. If elected, I'll present a motion and would hope for a seconder to develop a climate change and mitigation practices policies document. And to do that, I would like to involve a number of public information meetings to gather community input because developing these, as someone once uh, mentioned earlier here by just a group of seven or whatever, whatever, you know, we need input from everyone because it's going to affect everyone. Identifying vulnerable in infrastructure, such as sewer lines that are at or close to sea level, for example, and a review of our new sewer plant location are key issues of concern that I have. So I, I'm, I'm certainly one of the converted and I would be looking for three others to uh, move this forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Warren. And that will conclude the uh, questions that you guys were given for the evening. Uh, we'll now move on to questions that come from the floor. Uh, and so if people have a question uh, focused on environmental issues, uh, please post it into the chat. Uh, ask uh, please be clear and concise and focus on things that local governments can actually tackle. Um, also, uh, what else we got? The public is uh, is not invited to unmute. We're going to do this through uh, chat only. Uh, so we have a team that's working behind the scenes to vet these questions. Uh, they're going to make sure that they're concise, on point, not redundant from what we talked about earlier today. Candidates, if you wish to answer the question, please use your raise hand feature. Uh, I will address you in the order that the hand was raised, uh, and you will still have one minute uh, to uh, to answer. Uh, okay, Monroe, we'll close questions from the floor. So uh, at some point, we'll close the questions from the floor and then give you one minute uh, conclusion. Uh, but we'll just see how this goes and uh, go from there. So uh, for the very first question, uh, it is, as I pull up my phone here, 
All right, the first question. Question number one from the audience. Development approval processes must account for many factors, including climate and environmental impact mitigation. As the development, as the development sector grows, increasing development costs, competition, and greater risk for developers heighten the need for local governments to be clear about development expectations to provide certainty at the outset of the development process. What will you do to ensure that the seashell, that seashell developers are required to create suitable parks and green spaces within developments, preserve natural drought resistant flora that curb the heat island effect and prevent disastrous runoff and flooding? I can restate the question for you again. Oh, Darnell, that, absolutely. Please, you have could one you, minute. Could you repeat the last part of that question? Because there was absolutely. a whole bunch of notes. That's what I was going to repeat. Mm -hmm. uh, what will you do to ensure that seashell developers are required to create suitable parks and green spaces within developments, preserve natural drought resistant flora that curb the heat island effect, and prevent disastrous runoff and flooding? Okay, um, parks and green space, there's always a trade-off with that. Um, we have staff who ma manage and maintain the parks. The more parks we have, the more staff we need to be able to maintain those. So it's a trade-off. And we need to ensure that the, the land that we get and the parks that we get are uh, something that we need for the community in a particular area. Um, natural drought, we're already in part, we are requesting that they have natural drought resistant plants on developments and that they take care of their um, stormwater on site. So they need to do a measure of the water on site before they develop. And then they need to ensure that once the development's done, there's no more runoff than what was there initially. Thank you. And I'm sorry, but we had timer troubles there. Um, and so for the next answers, I will have a timer running on my phone here. Uh, you won't, won't be able to see it, but you will hear the uh, audible beep uh, when we get to one minute. I apologize for that. And we're trying to fix it in the background. So just give me one second here. And Jerry, I will start your one minute when you start talking. Thank you. The official community plan needs to be revised needs to be updated as to do we need a new zoning bylaw that will oh i've got a I've got Forward. a timer in front of me <laughs> and <laughs> and we also need the uh, a zoning bylaw that will be fully compliant and consistent with a new ocp when that is developed and that in itself will provide the direction and the requirements to developers so the first step is a new OCP addressing all of these issues and the new needs as we face climate crisis and a zoning bylaw that is consistent with the OCP and the requirements that will be required as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, just uh, to my team, has there been a new timer signed in and should the, uh, should the candidates pin a new timer? Yes. Great. Uh, so for the candidates in attendance, uh, please uh, find the Blue Sky Timer. It's named Timer. You can pin that to your screen. Uh, we had to sign out of the meeting with the timer, so the meeting came in as a new entity. Alton, you would like to answer this question? Yes, I would, Keith. Excellent. You have one minute. Thank you. Um, we do have a number of things that need to be updated. You know, our subdivision control bylaw, our OCP, we know that it's you know nearing the end of its lifespan. Uh, our staff do work behind the scenes uh, on servicing agreements when developers come forward looking to build projects. But one of the things that I think we are lacking so far uh, is that we need to do more to encourage smarter, more condensed developments uh, that allow for more green space around them. Uh, we do have one developer who's trying to bring forward a project here in Seashelt with more green space, they're trying to do a, a stormwater retention pond on site that's gonna be a natural feature. Projects like that are what we need. Uh, projects like the Havies fit that vision, even if they do fit the bylaws and the OCP that we have in place by the letter of the law. Thank you. Thank you, Walton. Do any other candidates choose to answer this question? 
If not, we will move on. Oh, Diane, you would like to answer this question. I see your hand. You have one minute. Yes, I think standards for doing a very high quality sustainable development for housing. And we need to get a standard like that. The current standard we have is just not, not sophisticated at all. And so, and we also need to have covenants, uh, get developers to take the sensitive areas and put covenants to protect them. For instance, I had one in Strawberry Vale where 40% of a Gary Oak Forest was, um, of the development site was put to Gary Oak Forest and proper housing was put in place. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, okay, I will take it. That's it for this question. And uh, we will be moving on to the next one. Uh, question two from the audience. Since solar energy is such a key renewable energy in enabling communities to reduce their carbon footprint, will you push for solar panels on all suitable municipal buildings? Thomas. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, in, in short, I'm a big advocate of solar um, and um, alternative energy sources. Um, I, uh, I would love to explore opportunities to be able to incentivize um, uh, developers, uh, even uh, home property owners, to be able to leverage them. Um, it's, it's the future. It, 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 it relieves power from the grid. Um, it's, it's clean power source. It's, yeah, it's something that we have to embrace. Thank you, Thomas. Tim. Uh, again, yes is the quick and easy answer, um, and uh, I, I totally agree with Thomas. Uh, we do need to incentivize uh, homeowners and developers to to do that. Uh, however, uh, first we need to get these water meters activated, as as that is a much more pressing issue than uh, electricity would be uh, would be our water. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Darnelda? Yes, I am totally in favor of solar panels on all municipal buildings. Um, we are in the process of building right now the operations center. When we proposed to put solar panels on that, we got huge pushback from the community because of the additional cost. So um, yes, I'm in favor of it. And I think we need to do more work in our community to get that moving forward. Um, at the SCRD, they are working with the Solar Society on the Sunshine Coast to evaluate all of the public buildings to find out which ones would actually uh, save money by actually having solar panels on there, like a shorter payback time. So that work's being done. Um, disappointed about the op center. Thank you, Darnelda. Next up, Anna. I totally support that uh, plan. I think it's very good for community have a green energy and to have the solar solar energy. And also, uh, I suggest maybe we have the wind park, like uh, some others uh, can save save the local energy and also uh, like uh, people get the benefits and uh, uh, save uh, taxpayers money dollars, you know, and also uh, create a, a green green space for people living environment. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Brenda. Hi, thanks, Keith. The mayor took most of my answer as it relates to the op center, but I think I will, um, I just like to add that, um, you know, we all, we need to be on the lookout for, for grants, which could offset the cost um, of installing solar panels. And I'm, I think when we gather the, the evidence that in the long run, um, it's gonna save us money. I think that will help with the community uh, conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Brenda. Adam. Uh, you're on mute, sir. Sorry, just a quick follow-up comment. Maybe on the op center, the town goes back to look for funding of it later on at a later date. And I noticed there's a, there's a side comment on, would you limit natural gas to new buildings? And, and really, I think we should be looking to solar as more of a solution rather than natural gas. Thanks. Thank you. Jerry. I lived 
off grid, off the power grid for a number of years. It's not always simple. It's not always inexpensive. Moving forward as technology changes and improves is possibly uh, that solar is the way to go uh, for municipal buildings if it can be shown that there is going to be cost savings and a benefit to the community. At this time, there are so many assets within the District of Seashell that have not been maintained and require funding and need to be maintained and upgraded to meet the needs of, the, of our climate as we move forward, that it would not be a priority until such time as the technology meets the needs and can be proven to be cost effective and a financial gain for the local government. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Darren. A number of years ago, I went on and on about this when we talked about the oper operations center. I think that uh, Darnelda may have seen it, although she sounds like a supporter, as uh, my commentary was annoying. Uh, but I've been talking about it for a number of years. I want to see on the operations center. I wanted to see solar panels on many of our buildings. School district came to me and said that the payback was 12 years on a number of buildings that they were doing. And then the mall went and did it. Why can't we do it? Why can't we look at it? Why don't we look at wind turbines as well? Why don't we look at ocean water turbines where there's rapids and ocean water moving? We need to look at all alternative sources of providing power. Electrical power is cheap now, but it may not be forever and they may need other sources of generating power, which the population is not comfortable with. Let's do solar, let's do wind, let's do wave. It's up to the municipality to model behavior and set a standard. Thank, Thank you, Darren. Donna. The, uh, certainly solar power, power is, uh, there's no question in terms of the benefits. I think one of the things that I hear, um, and certainly something that I've been looking at for my own home, is that it is very costly and that the return on the investment does take some time. Um, however, it would be something to look at is more and more organizations, maybe municipalities, other organizations, start to look at what opportunity there is to be able to buy, um, not necessarily in bulk, but maybe provide more uh, business for some of these uh, people that are, that are providing solar panels. The SPCA did some uh, solar panels this year through fundraising, and they have some pretty significant numbers on their cost savings. And uh, certainly nonprofits can really, really benefit from uh, you know, having solar panels because they have so little money and their operating costs are high. Thank you, Donna. Warren. A few things that we could do is we could require rough ends for new commercial buildings uh, for, the, for, the, for solar panels, um, which could be easily done. Um, I think if I remember during my term, uh, one of my terms on council, we had required rough-ins for residential construction. Um, I stand corrected on that, but I, I believe that's what we had intended. And we could also look at possibly developing a retrofit program for existing commercial buildings. Just some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Uh, Alton. Thanks, Keith. I, I thought I'd better get in on this question since everybody else answered it. I didn't want to get left out. Um, I am a huge supporter of solar. I've got a small array on my own roof to see if a larger array would work on my property. And it's looking like that'll be the case and that it's going to be cost effective. We know that solar can be a benefit in the long term once we get over the initial installation costs. If we, can, if we can't get grants for it or we can't afford it when we build a project, then we incorporate the conduits and space within the building to add it in the future, which is what we're doing with the Ops Center. You know, an opportunity comes along in the future, we'll put solar on that building. Uh, if we've got other equipment or boilers that reach end of life, how can we replace them with smarter, more energy neutral or even energy positive options? Thank you. Thank you, Alton. Uh, Jerry, have you already answered this question? I have uh, commented once. Am I permitted to make another comment? Uh, sure. You can use your rebuttal for the evening. Is that what you choose to do? Sure. That would be great. 
Thank you. The, uh, the District of Seashelt has had a solar uh, system installed at the Eptide sewer plant for a number of years. And the question that I would have to Seashelt moving forward with solar, with solar is how has the uh, solar system at the sewer plant performed? Has it paid for itself yet? Or when is it anticipated to pay for itself? And how much is the cost to maintain that solar system annually to maintain it and to upgrade it? That would provide information on what I, as a mayor, would uh, consider looking forward to how we would be spending money to maintain assets and asset management and use of very limited and restricted funds within the District of Seashell. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, we will move on to the next question now. Question number three from the audience. This one comes from the Seashell Watch Party, a group of people watching at Capilano University tonight all together. Uh, so this comes from them. Uh, would you support moving Seashell District Banking uh, from RBC, which I assume means the Royal Bank of Canada in this question, uh, the largest funder of oil and gas of the oil and gas industry to the local credit union, uh, where our tax dollars would stay on the Sunshine Coast? Adam. I, I would support that um, that move, even if. Uh, but I don't know what limitations that we are going to lose uh, by making the move. Um, I don't know if the uh, Sunshine Coast Credit Union can offer the same array of services. So uh, it it may move may mean the town moving part of its financial services over to the credit union, but it's. Uh, um, I think it's a. It, we have to follow through if we really believe in climate change, that's a major move. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Darnell there. Thank you. Um, that is an operational issue. And as a council, we typically don't get involved in the operational stuff you know, that goes on behind the scenes. That's how they actually run the municipality. We have talked about this, um, but it's always a balance between uh, being fiscal, you know, stewards of the district's resources versus having it locally. And we have to play those off against each other. So staff staff do this. Um, we can provide guidance, but um, it, again, it's operational. Thank you, Darnelda. Tim. Yeah, that's what I had actually assumed. And I was going to uh, say pretty much that, that I believe it's something staff needs to look into, but it is, I think, a, a great idea and something that I would, uh, as a council member, push staff to, to definitely uh, investigate. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we will be moving uh, without any other people wanting to answer, candidates wanting to answer, we'll move on to the next question. Question number four, this is also from the Seashell Watch Party. Uh, do you support Seashelt moving more quickly to higher levels of BC Energy step code? SCRD, Gibsons, and Seashelt are at step one, but Squamish is at step four, West Van at step five, and the, the highest level, Powell River at steps two, soon to be step three. Darnelda. Thank you. Actually, District of Seashell is at step two. Uh, there was an agreement that the local governments would move in conjunction with each other. Uh, Gibsons and the SCRD did not move to step two when the District of Seashell did. A couple of things that we, we found when we were looking at implementing the step code was, one is it requires an energy audit. We didn't actually have any staff on the coast, any trained people who could do the energy audits for the developers. So there's ha we've had to be, be doing some um, building up of resources and information and knowledge behind the scenes to ensure that as we move through these step codes, we have the resources that the development industry needs. 
We also have to educate the development developers because um, each step requires more work on their part and they need to know what that is and what has to be done to meet it. Thank you, Darnelda. I'll be moving on to the next question and I'm thankful that it's a long weekend so that I can research what step code means. Uh, moving on. Oh, Tim wants to answer. Perfect. Yeah, I, I was just uh, about to say that. I literally just looked it up right now and <laughs> it is very interesting. I would definitely be uh, open to investigating that further and moving our step code up. Thank you, Tim. Uh, without further ado, we'll move on to question five from the audience. Uh, this question is from Maureen Bodhi. Uh, it says, are you prepared to move to and or vote to stop any more natural gas lines going into new buildings in the district of Seashell? There's another question coming in. <laughs> question number six. This is from uh, Connie Simonson. It says, what is everyone's position on a reservoir as a solution for the water issue? Darnelda. So the Sunshine Coast Regional District is actually investigating a reservoir right now. There's some geotechnical work that has to be done. Uh, costing has to be done. Are we in support of it? Am I in support of it? I don't know. We don't know what the cost is. One of the things we need to do is find out what the cost to build the reservoir is so that when we look at other options, we can compare the cost. Um, it might turn out that the reservoir is cheaper than potentially Clahome or desalination, but we don't know that and won't know until we actually have the cost in front of us. Thank you, Darnelda. Uh, next up, Anna. I see your hand, Diane. I, I, I've, uh, those days I interview with my neighbor they gave me, uh, they gave me uh, another suggestion. I think it's very smart, and uh, I want to uh, maybe uh, give this. If I'm elected, I'm going to tell uh, to develop more about this situation, you know. And uh, uh, I think uh, they said we have existing reservoir. We 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 don't we don't need to uh, uh, build another one. We just uh, uh, dig more and then get a deeper, you know, uh, save more, more uh, tax uh, taxpayers dollars and also uh, save the space for the community. And uh, I think uh, I'm going to uh, support that, you know, uh, for the reservoir, you know, like a deeper, go to deeper, not like a build a new one, you know, deeper because we, ha we can save more, more uh, waters and then for the, for the winter, for the summertime use, you know, Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Alton, and I just want to address uh, Darren and Thomas. I believe, I know Diane had put her hand up. I believe, Mickey, had you put your hand up to answer this question? Just nod or something to tell me yes, no, yeah? By mistake, no. sorry. Very good, okay. I just wanted to be clear. All right, uh, Alton, you'll be up next, and then Diane, and then Darren. Thanks, Keith. Um, Darnelda mentioned, you know, some of the things with the reservoir. The the cost that we're looking at right now, fifty two million dollars. Is that the size we need? Uh, if we install water meters and get some of these additional wells online, can we build a smaller one? How far forward do we want to look when we look at a reservoir? You know, we did uh, the previous board did look at deepening the channel at Chapman Lake. The provincial government turned that down. They said they wanted us to diversify our water sources. That's something you know this board has been working on. Uh, the one thing about any reservoir that's tied to the Chapman system is that we're still reliant on the Chapman system. Uh, that's surface water. And if something happens in the ravine or there's contamination, that entire water system is still out of commission for us. Thank you. Thank you, Alton. We'll move now on to Diane. Thank you. Yes, I think we need to explore um, a reservoir. I think it's the only real long-term solution. 
aside from extreme conservation, which I know a lot of people aren't that keen on. I would like to see if we could work with the band to create a natural reservoir from all the blasting they do, because of course they need water as well. So I'm hoping that would be something that could be explored rather than the big concrete bathtub approach that engineers um, seem to be costing out. And uh, so definitely need to explore it. Not sure we can afford it, thanks. Thank you, Diane. On to you now, Darren. Yeah, I'd like to see us investigate it. I know that the board a number of years ago, one of the problems was there was a, a difference in the board between looking at siphoning in the channel and those of us who wanted to look at a reservoir. Construction costs have gone up. So let's see if it's uh, actually feasible. But as many people have told me in the community over the last number of years, since I started talking about water in 2009, every, every year now, especially lately, it rains and water, water flows away into the ocean. We need to look at ways of storing that water that flows away into the ocean and using it with, on our growing population. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Thomas. Thanks, Keith. Um, so I, I'm, I, I wanted to echo Donelda on this. Like, I, I, I feel like it's, you need data to make decisions like this. I think anybody that um, stepped in and gave a, a blanket yes, I think would be um, fiscally irresponsible. Um, it, it's important to understand all of the, sort of the, the potential solutions on the table. Um, and it's more complex than just cost, it's environmental impact. Um, it, it's, it's complex. So I think we need to make informed decisions. We need to do the work. Um, we need to understand all of the options available um, and, and, then, and then make a call on these things. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, okay, uh, anyone else choose to answer? We'll be moving on to the next one. Question number seven from Anna Latanzi. Oh, Jerry, you wanted to answer this question? Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Regarding the reservoir and other options, one of the problems that people like myself and many other members of the public suffer from is that there's information that the SCRD and or the District of Seashell may have, reports that they may have, that we the public are not aware of. And when we ask questions, we don't get those questions answered. So when uh, Darnelda Seegers raised the issue of a reservoir a couple of days ago and again tonight, is where's the reservoir going to be located? Is what is the water source? Is now Alton's indicating that it might be a gain off of the Chapman system? And questions regarding, is this going to be a four season reservoir? And is it going to, be, if it's accumulating water in the high rain uh, seasons, which we're anticipating, like we experienced in November of 2021, what is going to happen? Thank you, Jerry. Uh, now, Tim, you would like to answer. Sure, yeah, just real quick. Um, further to what others have already said, I, I believe it's, it, it is a long-term project that we need to look at in the long-term. Uh, we need to finalize the short-term uh, projects that have started and are underway, as well as get water metering uh, completed. Uh, we, we need to know how much water reduction will happen once these meters come in right now we pay very little for water and we, as a whole community, as a whole Sunshine Coast, we are water hogs. We use a lot of water. And once water meters come into play, we, we will get a better, better understanding of, of how much water we need. And further to what other people have said, what size of reservoir we need and where it can be put. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Darnelda, you're choosing to use your rebuttal to this question? I am. Perfect. Thank you. So um, exploring a raw water reservoir, if you go to the SCRD website, there's a whole page on it where it would be and how it would happen. Um, it is in conjunction with Lehigh and the Seashelt Nation. Um, I also want to address the water issues that everybody has been talking about. When we um, look at a water source at the regional district, we have to do a year of monitoring because we have to see what the impact on a source would be on all of the, the surrounding area, uh, well, how it impacts other aquifers, how it impacts other wells. Um, so we have to do a full year of monitoring on that before we can even apply for a permit. 
So currently, Church Road Wellfield is ready to be on be brought online. We're waiting for the variable pump to come. Um, supply chain issues have delayed that. It was supposed to be here in August. We're now talking potentially end of this year. Thank you, Darnaldo. <laughs> Uh, as we are already over the nine o'clock time limit, uh, we're gonna we're gonna present one more question from the audience, and then that will be the final question of the evening. And then the candidates will have one minute uh, as their closing remarks. Uh, so we'll get into the last question now. This question is from Anna Latanzi. Uh, she says, given that vehicle gr greenhouse gas emissions are the most significant, how would candidates address reducing emissions from this sector? Adam, you have one minute. Thanks, uh, Keith. Um, yeah, it's. Um, I think it's going to change um, slowly over time as people update their cars. Uh, but I think uh, one of the things that's not being addressed in terms of GHG emissions is the town tackling the larger uh, uh, companies in the Sunshine Coast who have large fleets of trucks. So I, I think that's part of what uh, the town has to do in terms of its climate change policies moving forward. Thanks. Thank you, Adam. Brenda. Thanks, Keith. Um, I think continuing to work on our active transportation network um, is going to be key. We're soon, well, not soon in, in a term of a lifetime, but nothing happens overnight. But uh, we have uh, four uh, steps of our active transportation grant that we're gonna get started on, which is gonna connect West Seashell through down West and East Corpus Bay. Um, and I think we sure we, we need to make sure that um, higher density development is on transit routes. You know, look at things like through the SCRD, uh, replacing large buses with small ones, the electrification of buses, um, all those sorts of uh, ideas would go to reducing our CHG, G, GHG, CHG emissions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so that will conclude the, uh, oh, Diane, I see your hand. I just want to say that um, we have a lot of people who commute to Vancouver and that's using a lot of gas and uh, a lot of major cities are as a way to reduce those emissions. They're reducing their um, planes and uh, non-public transit services between major cities, you know, Toronto, Montreal, et cetera. So I think we need, can look at something like that here, maybe have a nice little ferry service to take people, you know, to Vancouver. <laughs> without having to take our cars so we can take public transit and really reduce our costs. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Darren. Yeah, I mean, we, we all know from looking at the statistics that uh, industry is actually the largest uh, producer of GHGs. Um, but uh, in our community, we would most likely focus on transportation. So we need to look at alternatives. We need to look at the growing electrics industry and the hookups that have occurred over the last number of years and the large subscription service of our community, the electric vehicles, the encouragement of that. Bicycle and walking paths need to be expanded. Transit routes need to be strengthened and side transit routes need to be expanded upon. And one thing we have to look at is flow, to, flow through traffic. The more you stop traffic, the more it spews GHGs into the atmosphere. So if we can do our lighting systems, our traffic light systems to be all green at the same time, move traffic through our community and get the GHGs off, get the smoke and the, and the pollution of the GHGs off our roads as quick as possible and get people moving. That's one, within the speed limit, that's one, that's another way to do it. So there's a number of things we can do to re reduce GHGs. Thank you, Darren. Alton. Thanks, Keith. Uh, new electric vehicles. Uh, both the District of Seashelt and the Sunshine Coast Regional District are purchasing them and they're part of the electric fleet strategy for the SCRD. Uh, electric parks maintenance equipment, they're moving away from the two-stroke gas and the, all the gas equipment towards electric as things wear out. Uh, one of the things with the electric fleet strategy that we're working at in conjunction with BC Transit is the electrification of our transit fleet. You know, they're big, they're heavy diesel buses. 
those are going to be moving towards electric. Uh, as governments, this is one of the easiest ways for us to model the behavior we want to see. And the, you know, we know that in British Columbia, we're leaders in this shift towards green transportation. We even have private sector companies experimenting with items like electric float planes. Thank you. Thank you, Alton. Thomas. Uh, just a quick layer on top of what everybody else has said. I think one of the, the, the big things here is, um, is is getting people out of cars when, when people are traveling on their own, um, trying to discourage that and provide um, viable alternatives and, and cycle paths, I, I see as being a really big way to do that. Um, there's been some progress here. I think there's still lots more opportunity. So looking for um, ways that we can um, increase and make it more accessible for people to use um, e-bikes, uh, bicycles, um, so that they can um, take more health conscious um, approaches to um, moving themselves around. Thank you, Thomas. Okay. Uh, so without further ado, that concludes our uh, question period for this evening. Uh, thank you candidates for taking uh, those questions off the cuff. I realize how uh, intimidating that can be. Uh, so thank you very much for being uh, so welcome to the process. Um, so now with, uh, we'll move on to our closing statements. Uh, those will be one minute closing statements. Uh, we will start uh, at the beginning. We started introductions with the mayors. At the end, we'll, we'll start introductions with council. And I'm going to work uh, alphabetically backwards, uh, which leaves Elton Toth. You'll have your first, you'll have, oh, sorry, there, there are two minutes. I said one minute, but there are two minutes each. Uh, so you'll have two minutes. Oh, no, that's the intro. Nope. It's definitely one minute. One minute answers for your extra. And uh, Alton, you can go first. Giving me false hope there, Keith. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers and everyone who came out tonight and who watches this later on YouTube. Obviously, I hope that you'll support me on October 15th, but if not, that's okay too. Uh, the most important thing is that you get out and exercise your democratic right to vote. And when you vote, think about who you want, who you really want leading your community for the next four years. Voting out of spite or against someone doesn't serve our community in the long term. We need to be thinking more about Seashelt, not just of the Seashelt of tomorrow, but of six or seven generations into the future. Thank you again and have a good night. Thank you, Alton. We'll now move on to Adam. Thanks, Keith. Um, I, I think there are a lot of really interesting ideas that have been aired today, and I hope it gives the viewing public uh, a better sense of the issues that are gonna be tackled in the new council going forward. Um, I'm fully supportive of uh, updating of the uh, official community plan. I think it's a, an important component that everyone here seems to agree on. Um, I, I still think, going back to my, my initial comment, that our, our absolutely number one priority for the new council is the water supply issue. And I know the mayor has addressed um, the uh, Church Road well uh, and the uh, uh, I think coming very quickly on the same timeline have to be the water meters uh, and then Langdale well, as Alton's mentioned. Thanks very much. Thank you, Adam. Moving on to Brenda. Thanks. So this is, thank you for tonight for all the groups uh, putting this on. This is such an uh, important topic. Earlier this month, I went to Dr. Um, Rachel White's presentation at chat and what she had to say was studying. Um, not that I needed a sign of any evidence, but she did a great job of laying it out. We are going to be seeing weather events that we're just not ready for, and we're going to see them more often. We need to be mitigating these risks. This involves planning. We know only too well that what we don't plan for ends up in a crisis. And let's not let that happen. So on October 15th, I would be grateful for your vote. And as Councillor Toth said, if it's not for me, just get out and vote. That's the most important thing. Let's make it over 50% turner or voter turnout. And I'd just like to add, um, if you didn't get your questions answered tonight, Alton and I are hosting an event, an event on Sunday at Seaside Center, 12 to three. It's a all candidate meet and greet and you, um, just drop in, thanks. Thank you. Uh, moving on, Diane. Um, well, I just want to say that, you know, my campaign is quite green. I'm wearing a green shirt 
my information is green. I'm talking about sustainability. I'm, I'm also a planner and I don't agree with the current OCP that's being proposed or zoning bylaw that's being proposed. It's got too much development in it that we don't have the water or necessarily the sewer infrastructure to do it. We haven't analyzed our environmental uh, priorities and it, it worries me. I'm worried about the future. I'm worried about uh, sea rise here and I really don't see um, a government that's looking out for the local residents first and so that's what I would like to do. Thank you. Thank you Diane. Moving on Darren. Just a reminder to everyone tomorrow go to reconciliation day. I wanted to thank Keith on the coast and the many volunteers. I wanted to end by just reminding everyone I had a, joined a good university education with experience and local ideas to make decisions that are based on local values, community consultation, and a unique perspective focused on Seashell's financial and environmental sustainability. My, my extended family and myself have lived here for over, 30, for over 35 years. It's home. When I make decisions, I always ask myself, what will this look like in 10 years? And is this good for Seashell? I've taken many university courses, read a lot of books, sat on committees and attended environmental conferences for over 15 years. I'm on this. There's hope, elect Inkster. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Moving on, it's uh, Tim. Oh, I need to work on my alphabet. So. Uh, I, I, I didn't prepare anything for this. Uh, so I'll just say first, thank you, Keith. Um, <clears throat> it was great having you as a moderator. Uh, thank you to all the participants out there in the audience. Uh, and uh, further to what Alton said, uh, he said it great. Uh, just get out there and vote on October 15th. Um, yeah. Uh, and as Brenda said, I'll be there on Sunday. I believe most uh, most of us will be there on Sunday. Uh, so come on down, uh, chat with us uh, about the issues that concern you. And as well, every Tuesday and Thursday during my campaign, I will be at uh, uh, Village Restaurant um, having a coffee. And uh, I may not be in the corner, but uh, if I am, come down and chat with me and uh, have a coffee with me. Thank you, Tim. Um, highly unfortunate as uh, I just wanted to point out, Thomas Bramble has left the meeting. He had a heart out at uh, 9.15. We were trying very hard to reach that. And I apologize that we weren't able to get to his closing statements. Uh, Sorry Anna, about that, we should have, uh, we should have switched. Yeah, uh, fair is fair. I, we, we, had to, we had to go in the, I had to do the mental gymnastics to do the math, to do the, the, the alphabet, you know how it is. Uh, Sorry? Coming up uh, next is Anna. Anna, you're up. Thank you for everyone. And uh, I will, you know, uh, my, my poster, I, I just write down like a uh, low up my sleeve, uh, serve to our, our community. I'm ready for that position, okay? And I'm going, I will represent a different ways of our community. Even though English is my second language, I'm going to use all my passions to serve our community, okay? And also I make a, I, I'm going to, I believe it is important to ensure that uh, variety of perspectives are considered our the decision made by the, our local government. I'm going to represent not only Chinese community, I'm going to represent everybody in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Next up, Donna. Climate change is everyone's responsibility and it starts with me. I want to thank Keith and all of the people that turned up tonight. I am so impressed on a regular basis of how many resources, informed, uh, intelligent members of the community that we have that care so much about this community. So I am think we are very, very blessed with that. We need to invite more and more people to the table with so many ideas. Uh, we're on the right track. We've got a lot of work to do, but we'll get there. And uh, if we continue to, to work with this diligence, 
with the group of people we have, community engagement, and uh, we will be top of mind for climate change now and every day. Thank you for coming out, everybody, and thanks, Keith. Thank you, Donna. Uh, moving on, Warren. I just have a couple of thoughts at the end of this. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you so much for uh, providing us an opportunity and for the community to hear words off the cuff, if you will, rather than a lot of uh, written candidate speeches. I, I think that's that's uh, made it an interesting evening to hear what people have to say when they're asked questions and and hope hopefully that we, we've gotten honest answers that uh, were from the heart. Um, I hope everyone takes the time to learn more about all of the candidates, to make a decision about who you think will will honestly represent the best interests of your community going forward. Uh, having said that, I think this election has been a wake up call if it has not already for a lot of uh, councils and communities throughout the province. And I hope that it's not too late that we can still put together climate control plans and, and all, all resolve all of these issues that we have. Uh, Thank you, Warren. Uh, and finally, for councillors, so we'll end with Mickey. Thank you. I have to say thank you for putting up with all of us and listening to our opinions. I wanted to say that um, over the next four years, the new council will face many challenging issues that are important to our community. The housing crisis affects us all. Renters searching for safe and affordable place to live, business owners that are facing staff shortages, concerned citizens that want a safe community and to help those homeless, and even first responders are overwhelmed by this crisis. Let's all get together and make Seashield something better. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Uh, now we'll move on to the uh, candidates for mayor, uh, and we'll start with Darnelda. Thank you, Keith. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you to the organizations who put this forum on. Um, as I know, and those who've been on council before know, there are lots of competing priorities that come before us when we're sitting at that table. And it's important that we have organizations like this that have that climate focus, that they hold us accountable. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you for Keith uh, for doing this, great job. Um, I wanna say thank you to the candidates. It takes something to put yourself out there and you know, be, put yourself out in front of the public and answer questions. Um, it takes, a, there's a lot of information to learn, uh, doesn't come overnight. So thank you for the work you're doing behind the scenes. Uh, thank you to those who attended. Uh, you listened and you asked questions. Um, and I would agree with Alton, like, yes, I'd love your vote and get out and vote. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darnelda. And uh, least, last but not least, Jerry. Uh, just take yourself off mute, please. How's that? That's great. Perfect. I'd like to thank the organizers and the public that compiled the questions. The questions uh, were thought provoking, triggered lots of research and lots of thought. That's the important thing is to get us all thinking. I'd also like to thank the members of the, well, the candidates that attended this evening for their responses to the questions because while I'm listening to the responses from the other candidates, I was also learning and I love to learn. What we need to do is to learn more so that we can make informed decisions. And through this process, I have learned and I will take that information forward. So thank you to you all. And again, my name is Jerry Patterson. My focus is on asset management, protecting the assets that we have, building the assets that we have to provide service and services. Thank, thank you, you, Jerry. Uh, well, that concludes the, uh, the debate for this evening.
there's a couple of acknowledgements that I need to make. Uh, one, thank you for all the candidates. Thank you for coming out. Uh, I know how much this is, what this means, and uh, I can I know how stressful this can be. I also want to thank the cast of thousands at the SCCA for uh, their tireless work on this. Uh, pulling off three debates in three days is a pretty impressive feat, uh, getting all of the candidates involved. I do want to mention also that all candidates were contacted uh, and uh, were given the opportunity to be here today. Um, some chose not to attend, and uh, that, was, uh, that wasn't uh, anything to do with the organization. Uh, I also want to point out at this time the uh, action for, uh, oh man, I lost my sheet now. Uh, I'd like to point out the Alliance for Democracy and the Sunshine Coast Climate Action Network, uh, working together with the SCCA, put this on this evening. Uh, also, uh, I would like to I would like to thank the public. Uh, thank you for getting involved in your democratic process. A municipal government has a lot of control over your life, and so for you coming out here today means a lot. Um, you stay tuned for the answers to the questions uh, coming up on October the third. Uh, the answers to all of the candidates' written questions will be posted on the SCCA.ca uh, so that you can go and review their answers, um, including the candidates that weren't in attendance this evening. Um, check the chat links for more information about engagements with the candidates for info. Uh, but most importantly, get out and vote. <laughs> This makes me every time a little verklempt. We have a really, really cool thing. And the, we have agency in this country that allows us to make change. Uh, and so advanced voting will occur on Wednesday, October the 5th, uh, from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. Uh, also on Saturday, October the 11th, from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. And general voting day is October the 15th, from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. Uh, this year, they're also doing uh, mail-in packages. Uh, if that's something that you're interested in, uh, you can just head down to the District of Seashell offices and they'll be able to provide you with those uh, packages for mail. Um, once again, thank you very much for attending and thank you for being part of this process. It means a lot to me. Thank you. <laughs>